What a blessing to be able to come together as God's people and study the Word of God. I say that every week, but we don't have uh, any greater blessings other than our continuing walk with Jesus and the promises that He's made to us. And one of those promises is very simply that He will meet us in the Word, and there we will meet the Word of God. And so today we're going to turn back once again to abiding or surviving. And what we're going to be continuing to talk about today is the vine dresser and how he prunes the vine. So I want to go back again. I remind you that our central text is John 15, John chapter 15, verse 1. I encourage you every time, don't ever sit before a preacher or a teacher letting them preach or teach without the Word of God open. The Holy Spirit, if you're prayed up and ready, will give you the Word of Truth from the Word of God and he will sound that tuning fork inside of you as to the validity of the Word of God and the truth of what's being taught and preached. More important than anything else I have to say, the validity of God, the confirmation of God, the affirmation of God. God's Word says in John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And one of the things that we have looked at intently in this scripture in John 15, and Jesus is teaching on the vine, and our necessity to abide is that our whole purpose after we come to Christ is to be fruitful. But the only way that we can be fruitful is to make sure that we understand that he is the trunk. He is the trunk of the tree. We are the branches of the tree. We are the branches of the tree, and we are commanded to bear fruit, not produce fruit, but to bear fruit as we stay connected to him, and the sap of the Holy Spirit and the life of Christ flows from the trunk to us, the branch. Now, last week we began to talk about the work of the vine dresser, to prune the vine, and we began to talk about how are some ways that God does that as a master pruner, if you will? How does he do that for every one of us who are branches? And the Bible says he's going to do it for everyone who is found in Christ, that he's going to prune us. And he's going to prune us in order that, one, we may stay connected to him and learn that that is our source of life, that he is by our connection. And the second thing is by very simply even when we are abiding in him, to accept the truth that he's going to prune us in order that we might bear more fruit, more fruit and then much fruit. That's what this text says in John 15. And I hope that you read it over and over again as I've encouraged you. And God will bring away many truths and implant them in your mind and heart when you do that. One of the ways that God prunes, we talked about last week. We spent a good bit of time on it, ran out of time, and so I want to pick back up today, and we're going to continue to look in the direction and the understanding of what God has revealed about how he prunes us as a branch. How does he do that in order that we might produce more fruit? Now, last week we talked about discipline. He brings it into our lives, and he does it for two reasons. One, for correction and two, for instruction. One, for correction, to say, listen, you're off track, you've got to stay, remain, you've got to remain uh, connected to me. You've let some things slip, so go back and reconnect yourself to me. And he will discipline us in our lives and correct that direction we're going in. But he also gives us instruction. It is to give us instruction to be valuable even when we are abiding in him and staying connected to him. Several years ago, I watched a documentary on vine dresser, a master vine dresser in Tuscany, Italy. And it was a fascinating documentary because it showed many things about the activity of the vine dresser and what he was doing and what his job was and what he was expecting and what he was anticipating when it came to fruit. And the first thing that they pointed out very quickly was, or one of the things that he pointed out, was the necessity of personally 
for each vine for personally measuring the amount of the water for each vine. Now that's me, that's you. We're, I know the Bible when we say Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. What I'm saying now to better our understanding and to help us in our Western world is to understand the trunk of the tree and the branches. And we are the branches. But what the scripture is teaching us here is that Jesus is saying, listen, my father, the vine dresser, the master vine dresser who prunes every vine in order that you might bear more fruit, he's going to do what is necessary in each and individual branch's life in order that they might bear fruit and then bear more fruit. And one of the things we talked about, as I said, was discipline. But what I want to talk about this week is one of the ways that God prunes us is by drought. Not just discipline for correction and for instruction, but he prunes us by means of drought. In order to make the very best fruit for the, uh, the branch, in order that it might bear the very best fruit from time to time, the branch must suffer. It must suffer. And it is a struggle to survive in the midst of a drought at times that our connection to the trunk, to Jesus, goes deeper and deeper. The one who is our root, the root of David. Now, one of the things that I've learned about farming down through the years, and as I scouted crops for a couple of years to work my way through school in South Georgia, North Florida, I learned that one of the things that seems so understated today is that farmers fear irrigation. They use it when they have to use it. I mean, that's understandable. We understand that. But do you know why they fear artificial uh, irrigation and they use it only when they have to? Only when they have to. Because they have recognized that when they artificially water and water, that they can get water. And what happens is the roots come to the top of the ground. The roots begin to, rather than grow downward, they come to the top of the ground. They stay shallow. And do you know what? It weakens the plant because then the sun is able to bake the roots and then the plants are weak enough that if there's a storm, they'll more easily blow over and, God, and insects will attack it. And God's, God, uh, God's will is found in our lives many times by means of drought. We wonder if God's up to anything and Many times we write, write it off because what's going on in our life isn't pleasant. But God brings us drought at times in order that we will not let any other source suffice for him. In order that our roots might go deep. What is it that God said to Jeremiah? Well, he said to Jeremiah, to the nation of Israel, who had walked away from him, who had disconnected themselves from him. They were no longer... Israel's source, they had turned to many other gods and had walked away from God. Anytime you and I make God equal with any other gods, guess what? And with anything else, when we make God equal, we have walked away from God because there is none like him. And he said to Jeremiah, he said, when you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you will find me. Then you will know, Ezekiel says 62 times when his people are in the drought of exile, 62 times you will hear God say to Ezekiel and to his prophets, then when I put you in the midst of a drought, when I put you in exile, when I separate you unto myself, then you will know that I am the Lord. That's how you will learn it. That's how you'll return to me. When you're in the midst of this drought of exile. And so God prunes his people. He does that. And he forces them to become rooted and connected once again to him and to look nowhere else. And so drought is one of the means that God uses to make us stay connected to the vine, to turn us back to him. Now, drought may be spelled many different ways. It may be spelled loneliness. It may be illness. It may be the drought of depression. 
And it may seem at that time that you're dying, that there is no way that the vine dresser can have your good and your best at heart. But we need to remember, God is the one who has forged the doubt that we're going through in our lives as a people and as a person. The vine dresser knows that in order for the branch to have the potential to produce the deepest uh, connection and quality and quantity of fruit, that they have to stay connected to him, to the main trunk. Now, when, a, when the vine dresser cuts back that branch, he doesn't cut it away. He just cuts most of it away. He will leave a small stem there so it can continue to grow and go back to producing the fruit quality and quantity that he desires. And so remember, no matter if you think you're in a drought right now, you will be. All of us are there from time to time. It's one of God's methods of disciplining us. God is the one who has forged the drought and brought it into our lives. And I remind you again of what Wiersbe said. Warren Wiersbe said, God may hurt us, but he will never harm us. He's doing it for our good and for his glory. And his glory is brought about by what? Producing fruit and more fruit. And so he's after both in the life of the Christian and in the life of the church. He's, he's after both in uh, the life of the now, that means this. It means very simply, God has placed a work order for the branches. And he's going to fulfill what needs to be done and have that work order completed by means of drought, if that is necessary. But even then, the word is, when you're in the midst of the drought, abide, remain, stay steadfast, stay connected to me, connect even tight you ever have been before when you're in the midst of a drought and if drought does the job as it did in the days of Elijah with Ahab in the nation why in the world will God fail to use it he will use it that's one of the methods that he will use and so when Israel walked away when Ahab turned his back and served the gods of Baal and followed Jezebel, God very said, I will bring a drought. And he sent word by his prophet, Elijah, for the purpose of turning his people back to him. And we see that that is exactly what happened when Elijah faced down the false gods and prophets of Baal. God turned his people back to him. Now they turned away again, but God's always in the process of bringing his people back to him, bringing his people back to him by means of drought. Sometimes churches go through droughts because we let disunity, we let every kind of distraction in the world come to us and our connection to Christ and his purpose for us, and we lose sight that our purpose given to us by God, the work order that he has given us, is not all of this other stuff. No, it is to bear fruit and to bear much fruit. Look at what the psalmist said. Look at what he said first of all in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. God said there in Psalm 1, in verse 1, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners. That means moving away from God's will, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, his joy, is in the law of the Lord. In other words, obeying God. And in his law, he meditates day and night. How can I obey God? And this is the result. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season and its leaf, its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and he prospers in whatever he does and that's what 
God wants in every one of our lives, and that's what he's going to bring about. That's what he's going to bring about. Look in Psalm 42. The psalmist knew drought. The psalmist knew trouble. The psalmist knew separation seemingly from God because he was trying to get his attention. Verse 1, as the deer pants, does that not point to a drought? That's exactly what it means. As the deer pants for the water brooks, they want water, want water, but the deer can't find it. So my soul, and that's the point God's wanting to bring us to, where our soul pants for you, where we become thirsty, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now go to verse 5. Verse 5. But the psalmist recognized that it was God who's brought the drought. As difficult as it is, as hard as it is to fathom what's going on, he knows that in the end, God has brought the drought. And because God has brought it and let it come to the psalmist only by the hands of God, he began to turn and he said, Why are you in despair, O my soul? You may be in drought. You may be in the, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. Place your faith there, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. And that word presence means for his face, I will see him again. I will see his face. I will enjoy his company in his presence. Look in verse 11. And he closes the psalm the same way. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. That is what God's wanting to bring about in my life, in your life. And so when the drought comes, we need to remember who has brought it, number one. And two, that it is all about bearing fruit and more fruit, causing us to learn to turn back fully and solely the tree branch, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our root, who gives us sustenance. And we are able to bear fruit as he produces it in us. And so drought is one of the things that God uses. Discipline, yes. Drought also. But now I want to talk about something that is more difficult probably than any of the rest for us to handle or at least as difficult. And at times it may be more difficult than anything we've experienced before. And that is dormancy. Now what does to be dormant mean? It is a period of inactivity. Inactivity, where God appears to be asleep in our lives or not present at all. But God allows dormancy to come into our lives at times because it is a necessity for fruit bearing. Stop and think about fruit trees. There are some fruit trees, they need a long, cold winter. A long, cold winter. They go into a period where all of their leaves are lost. They go into a period of seemingly being dead, just dormant. Nothing is going on. But why in the world would there be a season of dormancy for them? Because you will see that it is a means of preparing them for the next season. The next season. Every season serves a purpose. And that purpose is in order that we might produce fruit and more fruit, might bear fruit and more fruit. Now, that's so go through this discipline this period of dormancy thinking that we're done we're on the shelf god's never going to use us again wondering why in the world was i discarded it's that god we give we give we give we serve we serve we serve god sometimes says okay i'm going to put you dormant for a while in order that when your season comes anew that i have in store for you you might be more fruitful more fruitful and dormancy seems everything is dead. It says everything is dead. 
But I want you to know dormancy at times are the seasons of the Potiphar's in our lives and the prisons in our lives and staunch opposition that will not appear to move out of our lives. And we learn how to pray and we learn how to see God in a deeper way. And God says it's going to produce, it's going to bear fruit. Dormancy, again, appears that everything is dead. There's no life. You look at it and you say, well, it's done. I look at my life and say during that period of time, it's just done. God's over. It's over with. God's not going to use me anymore. There's no fruit. There are no leaves. The branch looks abandoned and forgotten. But how much is going on that is unseen? That's going on in this period of dormancy. It's a period of preparation for the season that is going to come, that is going to come. Let me share a truth with you, and that is it is extremely tough to be an arrow that is still or put back in the quiver for a while. It's tough to be an arrow that is put in the quiver for a while, but God uses us when he desires at the right time and at the right season. You see, the right season doesn't just involve us. It's going to involve those that God sends us to, those that God gives us an opportunity to make a difference in their lives with. And so we need to prepare during this season that we think is dormancy and accept that God's doing something in our lives to prepare us for what is coming ahead. Are there any biblical illustrations of this? Well, certainly. Go into the life of Moses. Moses was dormant for 40 years in the wilderness. And God says, your dormancy is over. And he opened up another in Moses' life, but he had to prepare him in that dormancy in the desert. And then I think about Joseph, a young man. When God says to him, this is what I'm going to do in your life. And Joseph, full of pride, for full of arrogance, excitement, yes, but all of the other two. And he was bragging about what God had said to him. Only to find that he would go into a pit. Only to find that he would go to work for Potiphar's house, only to find that he would spend time in prison because God was saying, yes, this is what I want to do, but it's going to take something before it can be accomplished in your life, before I can bring this to pass and you will produce fruit for me. And he puts him in a season of dormancy. And then David, all you have to do is read the Psalms. We've read some of those. David crying out again and again, feeling abandoned by God, feeling the discipline, feeling the drought, feeling the dormancy, being put on the shelf. He's been anointed as a young boy, but here he is as a man hiding in caves, running for his very life. Surely he's saying, what in the world, God? What is going on? And God is saying, I'm preparing you, David, for what I have said I want to do in your life. V.P. Edmund, he was the president of Moody Bible College. Any material that you can get that you come across of Edmund's, he's dead now. He died in the pulpit preaching just like he asked God that he might do. Any material you come across by him is rich, rich. Read it, read it, feed on it. But listen to what he had to say. He said, dormancy with its apparent destruction of all hope can be a deep discipline to the soul that would serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a restless, impatient day. We have little time for preparation and less for worship. We feel we must be active, energetic, enthusiastic, 
and humanly effective and we cannot understand why inactivity, weariness, weakness, and seeming uselessness should become our lot. It appears to be so futile and foolish without any plan or purpose. Let dormancy discipline your soul in the patience of the saints, in the promises of God, who will not suffer his promises to fail. And so God allows dormancy to come into our lives. I hope that you'll remember the things that we've talked about. I hope that you'll ponder those. I hope that you'll search the scripture to prove that they're true and to let the Spirit of God encourage you and to say to you, I'm doing this. This is in your life presently because of maybe he's brought discipline. Remember why? He's done it either for correction or instruction. He's brought drought into your life and you feel like I, I'm just drying up. And he's brought dormancy to the point where you feel like you're just totally shut down. And ask God to grant you the patience to seek him and connect more tightly to him than you've ever been before. What a great opportunity. It's not going to come any other way. If you want this to pass by and think that you're going to have a deeper relationship with the Lord, it's not so. I know that. My human nature and you know your human nature, our sinful nature is, once the pressure is off, we take a sigh of relief, and then, like James says, we forget what we look like, and we walk away. And so thank God for the blessings of discipline and drought and dormancy. Next week, I want to pick back up, and I want to look at one other blessing or discipline that God uses in our lives in order that we might bear fruit and then bear more fruit. I want to thank you again for taking the time out every moment that you do and every time that you can and every time we're together for us to focus together on the Word of God. I want to remind you we have prayer needs. They're expressed by Penny each week and she lets you know about those, so please check. And if perhaps you have some that have not been uh, stated that we know about and you want to make those known, please do. Call the office, call Penny, call me, call any of us. And we'll be glad to make sure that you get prayed for. We want to do that. It is our joy to be able to do that. In the meantime, lift us up also. We need prayer as well. And I want to remind you that we'll meet again Sunday if the Lord hasn't come back. We'll meet again as his people will look into his word. And I want to preach this Sunday, if I might and God allows me to, on the church, the church. Because you see, our connection with Christ is no stronger than our connection with the church. Yes, we have all kind of problems, but does Christ have all kind of problems with us? Yes. Did he ever forsake us? Will he ever forsake us? No. No. And so we're going to be looking at that very thing. Let me pray with you, please. Father, I thank you that every time we look and seek, turn to your word with our heart and our hand, God, asking you to speak to us, yearning and desiring, thirsting to meet you, God, that you, you do that. You meet us. You give us personal words. You give us words in general, but then, God, you give us that rainbow word that speaks to our heart and our soul right where we are, even in the times of great blessing, but also in the time of discipline, in the time of drought, Lord, in the time of just very, very simply being Put on the shelf as we've talked about in a dormant season of our lives. You have a word for us because you said, say to us as you said to Jeremiah, when you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. He didn't say, if you seek me in the good times. He said, when you seek me. And I thank you, God, that it's true. Now I ask that you be with each person. I ask that you be with Pumpkin Vine Baptist Church and close them encircle them, protect us, Lord, and use us, Lord. May our will, may our hearts be bent. May, may our greatest 
to please you in order that you might be glorified as we bear fruit and more fruit in your name. Amen.